Uh, welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar. My name is Seamus Murphy and I'm going to be your host this evening. This is the third webinar of a series looking at COP26. And in the previous webinars, we kind of looked at an introduction to what COP is and what it might mean for farmers. Last week, we looked at policy and how policy will be shaped by the outcomes of COP26 and climate change in general. And this week, we're going to hopefully get down to the nitty gritty of it, what farmers can actually do on farms and what thing, what we can do to reduce emissions and try and help achieve these goals that we've set out um, to achieve net zero by 2045. Uh, we've got two great speakers to help us to do that. Um, next slide, please. So first off, we've got Robert Ramsey, who will be looking at livestock and rising to the low carbon challenge. Now, Robert worked initially as an agricultural consultant in the AIR office, um, and then he moved over to the uh, specialist team in SAC Consulting as a livestock specialist or beef specialist. Uh, he since came back to the uh, general agricultural team in AIR. Um, he he uh, loves getting out on farm and uh, interacting with farmers face to face. So make sure you have plenty of tough questions for Robert this evening. Uh, then once Robert is finished, we've got Gavin. And Gavin, Gavin Dick has worked at the forefront of agricultural technology uh, for decades. Um, he has helped with knowledge exchange and uptake of new technology on farms throughout Scotland. And most re recently, he worked for three years with AgriEpi, trying to encourage and develop technologies on farms throughout Scotland. Uh, since the end of September, Gavin is semi-retired, but he's still doing ad hoc consult consultancy, um, helping farmers to make the most of technology. So without any further to do here, I'll hand over to Robert. Oh, sorry, missed that. Uh, one of the most important things about the whole webinar, um, questions. So if you could add any questions into the Q&A screen down in the bottom of your screen, um, you've also got the chat there really important to get these questions in. We should have a good 20 minutes at the end to get questions, uh, to cover any questions that you ask. So please, please, please ask any questions um, that you'd like answered from, from the two lads. Um, now, uh, over to Robert. Excellent. Thank you very much, Seamus. And good evening, everybody. As Seamus said, my two passions in life are beef and uh, people helping people and uh, it's a shame we're not all together in the same the same place, uh, but uh, yeah, we're, I think we're all aware of the times we're in. It's nice to see I was on on last week's webinar. It's good to see a good turnout again this week and some common names there again, some people back on. Um, could I just confirm, Seamus, can you see that slide okay? Yeah, all good. Thank you, perfect. So a... Uh, Livestock and rising, rising to the low carbon challenge. There's no doubt the industry is under quite a lot of pressure. You just have to turn on the, the news at any point and you, you can certainly see that uh, the, the level of pressure that we're under. And, and for good reason, climate change is a, a massive issue and, and we do have a part to play in that. But part of what I would like to do at the moment is just to put a bit of context around that and, and just basically you know show, show where we are in, in the grand scheme of things and, and highlight that it's maybe not just us. Um, but to start with, I'd like us just to take a step back uh, and my slide won't skip on. Okay, yeah, so just to take a step back and think about the word sustainable. So we keep hearing that we need to be more sustainable and automatically, I mean, I'm programmed to do it as when you say sustainable, you think carbon. And actually, when you think about sustainability for a, a, any business, particularly a livestock business, it's so much more than just carbon. So for it, for it, the businesses I work with on a daily basis, sustainability means profitability. It means having a good cash flow, a succession plan, good mental health, uh, supply of labor and inputs. And inputs obviously a huge issue at the moment. A, the business's contribution and interaction with the environment and biodiversity that, it, that it exists around and also carbon footprint. So carbon footprint is a huge part of sustainability but there is a bit more to it. And when you look at the level of public goods that we deliver as, as an industry, I, I find it difficult sometimes when we're just measured purely on carbon footprint, we, we don't get the credit for those other things too. 
that's not to take away from the carbon issue. It's just to highlight the fact that we are doing more, more than just a destroying the planet by having cows, which I don't believe for a minute. Now, my point here, carbon footprint versus environment footprint, environmental footprint, two scenarios here. The one on the left is a me at home out wintering. These are three shorthorn heifers. A, they've got a significant carbon footprint. They've got other part of, you know, there's a enteric fermentation process, part of the carbon cycle, but certainly emitters of methane, a significant greenhouse gas. So poor carbon footprint, but a very good environmental footprint, doing a lot for habitat, a lot for, a, for land management, and a, you know, certainly biodiversity, a, a huge part to play. The poor guy on the right hand side here is a victim of a very of a low carbon, you know, a, a very efficient process of palm oil production, a very, very efficient process, but a devastating in, environmental impact and, and loss of habitat. So there is there's those two things that carbon on its own is dangerous. And and to frame that, I suppose I used the broiler chicken, or I suppose we could use the Holstein cow as well that genetically we chased one single trait. So we chased growth for broiler chickens and we've chased yield for, uh, for Holstein cows. And we know the damage that we did there. So we got, we got somewhere, we chased a single trait and we made huge progress on that. And everything else fell apart round about it from fertility to certainly animal welfare was, was uh, devastatingly impacted in some cases. So I think caution when we're chasing one single trait um, and, and I think as farmers, we know that we're delivering a lot of, of different um, or different public goods there. Um, and we need to probably get credit for some of those too. On a global context, eh, this is our, our world and data figures. Just wanted to highlight where livestock production actually falls. Um, so livestock and manure production globally, that's not just ruminants, not just beef, that's all livestock and manure production globally comes to 5.8%, which is 5.8% is a significant part of the of the a, of the whole, and certainly something we need to, to look at to try and reduce. But if we come round that graph, we come to energy production 73.2%, and a part of that is fugitive emissions. So that's losses in the system, flaring gas, leaky pipes, just that bit that we don't know where it went comes to 5.8%. So as an industry, I think we're held up a, in a very negative light and, and certainly some of that criticism, much of it is due. There's a lot we need to, a lot of progress we need to make, but equally there are some other industries that I think are getting off quite, quite lightly. Don't want to dwell on that for too long and certainly don't want my message to be, we don't need to do anything. So yeah, business as usual, I don't think so. I don't think that's the way forward. We certainly, We've got a job to do, and as an industry, we're, we're part of we're, you know, we're a vital part of the industry. There was a I saw a protester, one of Chris Packham's protesters the other day, was dressed up as a bee, and had a sign that said "Farmers have had their day." Now, to me, that's very very short sighted, and and a, certainly farming has a, a huge role to play, and or it's the we our fundamental role is to, to feed the feed the population, and and that role does only ceases to exist when the human race ceases to exist. But as I say, we're part of a, a huge global problem and, and climate change, I think we can all recognize now as a, a significant issue a, and one that deserves our attention. And as an industry, we've got so much potential to actually deal with our own problems and actually help other industries deal with theirs too. So my, my point here is that as farmers and, and land managers, we've actually, we hold all the aces. We can improve systems, we can develop systems and, and reduce emissions that way. Soil sequestration, uh, peatlands and woodlands, sequestration of carbon is a, a huge area, huge growth area and a hugely important area. Making, me, making reductions in, in a methane production from ruminant systems is obviously very important and renewable energy, the list goes on. There's so much we can do and so many reasons why as landowners we should be positive about the future. But we do have this, Kind of elephant in the room, I suppose, is the, the carbon challenge. What what do we need to do? And we're tasked with reducing emissions by forty two percent by twenty fifty. Now that you know, it's a, it's a big number, forty two percent. But it also it's an interesting number that quite often we hear net zero banded about in an, an agricultural context. And and actually, the, the target is to make a, a reduction of of 
a of, of down to or of 42 percent sorry and you can see here as well that we actually are making some progress already so we can see the 2017 figures versus the, the 1990 figures some of that is accidental progress some of it's based on improvement in efficiency and some of it's based on uh, the national herd reducing and, and, and a reduction in output um, so we can see a direction of travel there and and you can see where it, the direction of travel takes us to is the third the third bar and the fourth one is the the desired the the, um, the ambition where we want to get to so we've got we've got a job of work to do uh, across the board and there's a lot of things to a uh, a lot of areas we need to make changes but we need to keep in mind that change isn't all bad you know we've been changing systems for years it's not that long ago we were milking cows and buyers and you know the agricultural revolution st is still ongoing and we're on the brink of a, a really exciting green agricultural revolution if we're not already in it so don't be scared of change it's certainly something that's that's coming but keep in mind that it's it's not all bad now this equation is uh, my equation and it's neither peer reviewed nor correct but for this purpose i think it's good enough and that if, if we keep in mind that we're, we're tasked with reducing carbon emissions and for the most part where we can make reductions in carbon where we can make savings there we can actually make financial savings too so certainly for the start of this journey as we as we look to improve businesses and, uh, and improve enterprises there's an awful lot we can do that will have a carbon benefit and also have a direct financial benefit as well and in a changing policy environment a changing subsidy environment that's also a real positive and you know there's a real incentive to to kick on and make some of these changes now this is in the in the beef world um we were involved with the, the beef climate work that was done by, by Jim Walker and Claire Simonetta, or chaired by the, by the two of them, um, to look at potential future policy and, and how we could actually make positive changes to businesses to reach the desired effect or a re desired reduction. And basically, this was some modelling we did, and it's a bit... It, it'd be better you know it'd be nice if we could talk about it for three or four hours and, and really understand it but really a snapshot in time or a, a, a starter for 10 on this one important to note as well that the report is there and available and, and and worth a read there's some some good stuff in there some some good pointers as to how to make improvements but really these are cumulative improvements so we looked at where the you know a base herd and then looked at this each scenario so what happens if we put more calves on the ground so increase the number of calves reared per 100 cows bulled so that made a, a an, an improvement and has to be said the the way that was modeled does that was modeled on the ideal so if we basically if we killed the cows straight away if it was empty the the improvement that can be made if we don't run it round for a full year which some people will do you know there's obviously um there's kind of unique examples there too but i'm dwelling on that one too much so if we increase the number of calves reared we make a positive a uh, step in the right direction if we then look at a uh, age at first calving so reducing from three years to two years we can make another a uh, significant step and that's based on not having that um, unproductive year of a, a heifer between two and calving at three. Uh, looking at cow weights, so overall cow efficiency, if we can reduce the cow weight by 10%, um, that takes us up another 1% improvement. Um, and that's us just short of 10%. So remember, we're looking for 42. And if we come down through all these, or as a whole industry, we're looking for 42. But if we look down through all these options, we get into things that are a wee bit more complex or a wee bit more um you know requiring a bit of technology as well looking at age of slaughter very important uh, and if we can reduce the days alive on farm we can make a positive impact there and looking down through all of this we come to just short of 40 percent so tweaking around the edges you know if we can make some marginal gains here there's progress to be made but there's also a role a bigger role for whole system changes and, and for, for technology to step up as well. But what this model is showing you, though, is that there's a heap of progress that we can make if we step up and, uh, and, and make a start to it. Um, mitigation measures, and, and I hope we'll discuss these at, at more length in, in the, the question session, but really there's any amount of mitigation measures out there and some great practical options coming on. We've um, 
we're seeing a, a real emergence of regener regenerative agriculture, which has some really exciting, really exciting systems, and certainly many people getting very involved in that. And for um, you know, there's there's also key principles there, same as in organics. There's key principles there that we can adopt into conventional systems as well, and and start to make to drive a bit of change in in systems as well. Um, the main thing with mitigation measures is many of them have have no cost and, and actually have a, a positive impact you know they've got a, you know green manures and arable uh, scenarios and there's there's great options there try and go for things that are easy and and the whole the, the whole point would be to improve overall farm efficiency um and with the target being that we've got a benefit to the farmer and crucially to the environment and and in many cases that's the as i mentioned before it's the environment it's the carbon element, but also the biodiversity element. And I think the two, for me, the two are, are so important. They're very closely entwined and, and, and I don't think we should try and separate them out. But from a mitigation perspective, it's the win-wins that we're really looking for. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of scope in here. From a carbon perspective, so we're doing a lot of, of carbon auditing and I, I expect our job going forward will be more and more focused on, on carbon auditing. Now, carbon auditing is only one, one part of the story, uh, but certainly very important to find out where you are. If you don't know where you are, it's very hard to know where you're going. So it's a great a great tool, a great way of, of finding out where you are. And it finds out where your carbon inefficiencies are. And as my great equation at the start goes, it also shows where those financial improvements can be made as well. So I would encourage everyone to get involved and, and, and make a start with some carbon auditing. Um, and, and the good thing there is you're not, there's no point waiting until we get forced to do it from a subsidy perspective. Whatever we do now will be rewarded going forward as well. So uh, it's a, a great chance to look. Many of you will have done that anyway. So looking, we're thinking about change, and I'm really just putting this one up to, to sow seeds, really. And, and for, I suppose, I need to nail my colours to the mast here. I am a suckler cow breeder. A, my job relies on suckler cows. I'm a big fan of suckler cows. But from a carbon perspective and from a systems perspective, they're not necessarily the right tool in, in every scenario. We, and I, I work in Ayrshire, as Seamus said, and, and there's a lot of ex-dairy farms quite quite heavy land and a high rainfall area where we see a lot of suckler cows as they've moved out of dairy and into the next enterprise, which has been the suckler beef enterprise. And actually, if we, if we look at the, the efficiency of resources on the farm and also the carbon output, those farms are far better suited to rearing dairy beef or rearing a store cattle or, or you know being involved in a different system. So, from the carbon perspective and, and crucially the financial perspective, there's, it is important to have a look and, and just check, make sure, are you carrying the right type of stock for the, for the farm that you've got? Um, and we can come back to that if anyone wants to, to discuss that in more detail. Um, where is this growing interest in carbon coming from? So obviously from a government perspective, these targets are legally binding and as COP26 approaches, there's going to be more targets more um you know there's going to be as uh, more pressure on on us all to meet targets um as you know the weeks and months progress so governments are obviously driving it but i think it's really interesting now is that actually probably the market is moving quicker than the government is so government is changing policy as, as stevie the, those who heard stevie last week uh, will know and if you haven't heard stevie it's well worth listening to the recording from last week um but the governments are quite slow with Brexit and COVID and, you know, that there's change is quite, there's been a, a few delays uh, and a few extensions to schemes and things to keep the status quo going, but the markets are actually responding quicker and we see a lot of retailers and pro processors align contracts coming in, which have a real focus on low carbon and even zero carbon production. And, and most of those have targets of 2030, some down to even 2025. So interesting to see that market really getting into gear and for me once the market really starts valuing this that's when we really start seeing change uh, so quite exciting we also see that you know um corporate farms uh, i suppose that's the same thing they're really showing where they're at demonstrating a uh, low carbon credentials to to whoever they are supplying 
And another interesting one um, is, is banks. So banks are now actually looking for carbon audits as well. And increasingly into the future, we'll be looking for, for carbon audits and there will be incentives for low carbon lending as well. Um, and that's as much to do with the, the bank's carbon footprint themselves as, as the business viability as well. Um, and then obviously, a feed technology companies and, and a whole myriad of other people are looking at carbon. And, you know, it's exciting to see the thing develop. And we just need to be cautious that we're um, promoting the right thing in the, in the right area. Um, so looking to the future, this is me just summing up. Hopefully we're OK for time. Um, subsidies are going to be focused on environmental performance. We've never really been there before. We've been production focused. We've had decoupled focus, which didn't really focus on a great deal other than keeping us a uh, viable. But now we're going to be environmentally focused with the you know public good scenario and um, exciting, interesting times there. The emergence of regenerative agriculture is certainly um, that those systems are evolving and, and have a, a huge role to play going forward. Um, and certainly things that a, a lots of certainly dairy contracts are looking into regen technology and, and options for that as well. So uh, exciting times on that front. Um, as an industry, or certainly, you know, there's no industry we can we can honestly see in agriculture uh, that doesn't need to improve technical performance. That's, you know, that's a given. If we can make improvements there, again, it helps the financial viability and also makes positive steps towards carbon footprinting. Um, Marginal gains are cumulative and effective. Are they enough to get us to where we need to be? I think that probably lines Gavin up quite well for his presentation, um, but certainly um, marginal gains. You start running a marathon by taking one step. And if we can take that one step, we're closer to where we need to be than we were when we started. So um, it's, it's time to kick on and, and, and start, start looking for issues and start rectifying things. Um, and then there is professional advice there to help, you know, there's, there's, and that's not a plug for business. There's any amount of people out there uh, who, are, who are available to help with health planning, business planning, genetics, soils, carbon footprinting. There's a huge list of, of new and emerging technologies there and certainly plenty of people willing to, uh, to discuss that with you. And really the inspirational bit at the end, we will actually do this. You know, as I said at the start, we're food producers, we are... Uh, the primary producer is going to be the last, the last industry standing. Um, we will rise to the challenge and make Scotland a world leader in low carbon regenerative agriculture. Um, so that's a strong statement to finish. And hopefully we can, that leads into Gavin's presentation and then we can get some good questions later on. So thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I guess it's my turn to speak now. Um, uh, Thanks, uh, Seamus, for that introduction. Um, I noticed that you said I was at the forefront of uh, technology for decades. And, and just to clarify that uh, it, it's the output of technology that really fascinates me. Um, and anything that could, could make my job easier and make me do a better job uh, has to be worth looking at. Um, I'm actually a complete Luddite as far as the technology itself is concerned. And that's why I'm not even allowed to may move on my own uh, slides and uh, Seamus is doing that for me. So apologies if there's a bit of delay between the, the slide changeover. Um, what, uh, what I actually want to do is to, um, I want to take it out beyond the, the detail of, of climate change. Um, it, it does worry me a bit that if you look at policymakers and academia researchers, they tend to focus uh, very much on individual elements of what's going on in a farm and especially in relation to the environment and emissions. Uh, and, and to my mind, we can't actually separate uh, contributing to uh, climate, mitigating climate change from our actual daily process of producing food. Um, the, the two to me are, are, are completely entwined. Um, and I think uh, the, the challenges that uh, farmers are going to be facing over the next five to 10 years uh, are going to push us into trying to maintain sustainable farm businesses uh, in a very different operating environment to what we've done for a long, long time now, decades in fact. Uh, and really Brexit, um, I noticed uh, Robert 
said subsidies will come from environmental uh, work. I don't actually think we're going to get subsidies at all. I think we're going to get supported by public to do good for the public. Um, and it's going to be up to, to us as farmers to uh, incorporate that into how we manage our, our businesses. Uh, and I think another uh, quick point is, um, again, Robert picked up um, carbon footprints. Um, I tend to call it net carbon balance because the issue with, that I have with uh, carbon footprints is they only tell one half of the story and they're very much focused on production efficiency and uh, emissions. Um, and, and as farmers with the, and land managers, uh, we have a, a great opportunity to actually store carbon, to sequester carbon as well. So it's a much bigger picture to me. I mean, the, the, the low hanging fruit or the tweaking is important, but I don't think it's enough. Uh, so I, I think the, you know, going back to sustainable farm businesses, the, the thing that's often forgotten uh, particularly when we look at climate, is that unless farms are profitable, they can't actually do anything to mitigate climate change. So it's really important that as in, within all this uh, challenges that we have and, and contributing to net zero, we, are, we also have to do it in a way that leaves us uh, as a profitable industry. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the ways I think we should be looking at going forward is, um, you know, th th there's lots of uh, fashionable words out there and production systems, um, whether it's uh, conservation agriculture or IPM or um, uh, regenerative agriculture, you know, you name it, there's a whole host and they've all got their good points and bad points um, and they all fit certain people. Um, and precision farming is one that's probably been put out there a lot in the last few weeks, but actually what is precision farming? I keep asking people what precision farming is uh, and I've asked hundreds and hundreds of people and I don't think I've got the same answer twice. Um, and I think we need to stop speaking about precision uh, agriculture or precision farming and actually become precise farmers because using precision farming doesn't necessarily make you precise. Uh, and there's lots of people adopting precision farming that are still managing their input, a blanket approach. You know, so if there's a field of uh, wheat needing fertilizer, the whole field gets it, not just the plants that are actually grown in the field. If you're going to worm uh, a group of cattle, you tend to worm the whole group, not just the ones that have actually got worms and need treatment. And, and I think we need to get away from this blanket approach uh, and we need to um, become much more in pre precise in how we utilize inputs and adopt a targeted approach. Um, so to my mind, uh, the pre precision farmer, or precise farming um, for me is, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's all about delivery of live management information, the individual unit of production level to allow farmers to make better informed decisions at an early stage in the production process. So it, it's the it, precise farming should uh, enhance the ability of the stockman or the agronomist uh, to make a much better informed decision at a much earlier stage and apply actually what's needed. So you can apply nitrogen to where the plant is that needs that nitrogen. You can treat the animal that's only needing treated. Um, and, uh, and that way we're, we're actually going to, uh, we're, we may actually increase the use of inputs in some cases. Um, so it may cost us more, but there'll be a greater cost benefit because we know that it's going to the right place where a plant can, can actually utilize it or an animal can utilize it. And the earlier we can intervene in the production process, the less wastage there is, whether it be milk production or plant growth or whatever, uh, and, and the more effective any intervention uh, action is. But that requires uh, a lot of uh, data being collected. It needs multiple data streams to be integrated and it actually needs something or somebody to interrogate these multiple data streams. And at the moment, an awful lot of that's done in the farmer's head. That's what a good stockman does or a good, good, good agronomist does. But it's certainly not precise because the human brain just doesn't have that ability. But technology can actually take over that 
collection, it can take over the integration, it can certainly take over the interrogation using um, AI and machine learning uh, to actually come up with uh, much more detailed uh, actions or suggested inputs at that individual animal or plant or field zone level. And it can do it much earlier in the production cycle. You know, we've got um, yield monitoring tools now that uh, are yield prediction, yield forecasting tools that can fairly accurately suggest what the yield's going to be at growth stage 31 in a field of wheat, which is just when you're putting on your, your last dose of nitrogen. Now, okay, it, it won't take, uh, it won't allow for a freak of weather at some point in the future, um, but it's, it's given you a much more informed decision about how much nitrogen to put on than just taking a standard rate and, uh, and applying that. Uh, the next slide, please. So to me, uh, farmers of the future are going to have to be data farmers, um, and they're going to have to use that data farming ability to, to make their decisions about how they rear their livestock, how they grow their crops, etc. cetera. Um, and I, and the, the additional element that, that's going to have to go into this data processing is, uh, is climate change um, and emissions. So if you take a pig producer, for example, um, at the moment, uh, he uses, uh, it could be pigs or it could be poultry, dairy to a lesser degree, but they use soya. Um, now, every pig producer knows that if you reduce your soya inclusion in the ration, the chances are you're going to get a drop off in live weight gain. But what the, farm, the pig farmer is going to have to decide is, well, if I drop my soya inclusion rate by X percent, that's going to reduce my emissions by a certain amount. Is, is that uh, more profitable in the long term than, than the drop in, in uh, animal performance and the live weight gain that I get. So that's an additional uh, decision that farmers are going to have to make going forward. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So as I said uh, earlier, the, the, the light bulb moment for me in all this was way back in the late 90s when, uh, when we put milk and robots in. And, and all of a sudden we went from managing groups of 100 cows to managing individual cows. And it was really quite enlightening uh, to see how much variation that previously we were ignoring within that uh, group of 100 cows. Um, and the dairy sector, it, it, it's fairly mature as far as the, the mindset around managing individual animals concerned. And there's a raft of uh, technology out there already um, but it's moving on at pace uh, into the other areas. And the picture on the, the top left-hand corner of the screen um, is actually a programme developed by Ukrainian uh, researchers. Um, and they can now identify individual animals without any electronic ID or tags or anything like that. Um, and they can apply, they, they use a colour. So every individual animal's got a, an individual colour. So we can actually start to, to monitor uh, individual animals' performance without any mutilation, as in, uh, in collars or uh, tags or anything like that. Um, and that, that's not only good for the industry, for the, the public perception, but if you've ever tried to put a collar on a limousine cow, then you'll realise it's a, a lot better for yourself as well. Um, so, so from that, uh, and, and the, the latest ear tags will actually be able to uh, distinguish between a normal calving and a difficult calving, so that you can monitor the calving, cow's calving from your house on your phone, and you can ignore it if it's a normal calving, and it'll tell you if it's a, if it's a calving that's likely to need assistance, and you can go out and uh, do something about it. Um, so, you know, th there's a, a huge step forward coming in technology. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, and again, this is uh, uh, a beef monitor unit used for uh, daily weighing of, live, of livestock, um, beef cattle in particular. It's been on the go for a few years now, but actually once you've got an animal coming in voluntarily to a, a, a point where they can start to collect data. It's not just the weight that you can collect. There's a whole lot of other things you can collect. Um, confirmation, um, fat cover, um, basically how it's ready for slaughter or not. 
um, you can then integrate um, shedding gates so that it can all be, if it's ready for slaughter, you can program it to go into a separate pen on the Sunday night ready for the float on Monday morning. Um, and that all leads to uh, an increase in performance because it takes away the stress. And the more efficient the production process, the lower the carbon footprint and the, the less emissions you've got. Next slide, please. So although the livestock sector uh, are probably ahead of the game as far as the, this individual unit of production concept is concerned, and in fairness, it's probably easier for them, um, the, the, the bulk of the, the work that's going on at the moment is probably in the, in the arable side. Um, and the soil has become a really important area. Uh, and, and obviously, if we can improve our uh, soil health, uh, then that not, not only gives us better production efficiency, but it also allows us to sequestrate more carbon. Um, so again, it's this double whammy of uh, mitigating climate change and at the same time uh, is actually uh, helping the, the farm business to remain profitable. Um, and things like, um, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with RB209, um, and the, that's equivalent in, in Scotland, which is the SRUC notes. I mean, it's the kind of the Bible for, uh, for deciding how much fertilizer uh, to apply. But you actually do the calculation, you do the soil sample in November and you do the, the calculation based on what you think the yield's going to be, um, what you think, the, yeah, how you're going to manage it, et cetera. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's actually, you're making the decision uh, months before uh, you're actually applying the, the fertilizer. And so nobody knows what's changed within that time. But if we can do it live uh, and remotely, then A, it's easier, but B, it's actually much more accurate. So you're making a much more informed uh, decision on how much nutrients you're, you're applying. And that reduces the wastage, uh, both in, in money, but also in uh, emissions, for, so that you make sure that you're just applying the nitrogen that the plant needs, you're applying it where the plants are. So instead of nitrogen landing on bare ground and disappearing as nitrates into the water or nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, it's actually going into the plant and being converted into something that you can sell. Um, and there's numerous people working on, uh, on this remote sensing uh, at the moment. Very few of them are actually from an agricultural background, which makes it even more interesting because they come with a, uh, a blank sheet of paper, if you like, and, and no preconceived ideas as to what happens. That's also got issues when you try and make sure that it's actually practical and, and can be utilized by the farmer. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I'm just going to run through some examples of, uh, of, of where uh, this much more informed uh, decision-making to take place and the technology that delivers the data to, to do it. Um, I think the, the one in the middle is quite interesting for me and it's a piece of kit that's actually an NIR sensor that uh, goes on to the firmer on the back of a seed cutter uh, for larger seeds in fairness, so it's maize, peas, beans. Um, but it actually it assesses the soil condition and it will automatically adjust the planting depth to put the the seed at the optimum place in the soil to, to get a quick uh, germination. Um, so if you can save three or four days uh, in the, in the, before it emerges, you know, that's an extra three or four days that it's going to put on yield. Um, the one on the right is quite interesting as well. Um, you know, we, we know all about the uh, issues with pesticides. Um, I was listening to somebody uh, on the, the television today who was saying that we've lost um, a huge percentage of our uh, biodiversity and a large part of that is down to the wholesale use of um, pesticides. Uh, but we can now start being much more uh, informed as to how we apply or deal with uh, pesticides. Um, and this camera guided hoe was actually developed in a farm down in England who's got uh, herbicide resistant black grass, um, but it's it's a machine that's used regularly in the vegetable sector where they've got nice wide rows, but we've adapted it to fit in behind a cereal drill 
So it's operating behind a Vaderstat drill. Um, and we've actually put the RTK system on the drill rather than on the tractor pulling it, and then put the same system onto the drill rather than the tractor and taking the direct coordinates across. Um, so the drill's actually steering the tractor rather than the other way around. Uh, and the, the cultivator then is following the, the exact um, line that the, the drill, and that means there's a lot less um, sideland uh, movement uh, and the cameras can then do the fine tuning. Next slide. Um, so crop monitoring, uh, again, at the moment, we do that with an agronomist going into the field. Um, if you're a good agronomist, you do a W across the field. If you're a, uh, in a hurry, you go in the gate and have a quick look and use the programme that's already been, you've been told to use. Apologies to uh, agronomists out there. Um, but it's just, you, you're not making an informed uh, uh, evaluation of the, the whole field. Um, and we can do that now do that remotely. Um, I mentioned the, the yield um, forecasting uh, tool earlier on, um, and that can be on your mobile phone, uh, it can be in the office, uh, wherever. Um, and the, I think the, as with livestock, the crops, the cameras are going to be the, the big thing going forward. Um, and what data scientists can do with images now, whether it's again from your mobile phone or whether it's from a satellite, um, is amazing. The, the, the definition that they can get down to and what they can actually pick up. Um, and we've also got um, sensors that are sniffing crops to detect things like septoria um, or molds. Um, it's, it's in quite common practice in the vine industry. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's, it's going to come into the, the general um, crop production uh, as well. Next slide, please. So I think another area that I think is maybe forgotten about is, uh, and, it, and it's particularly relevant when it comes to the emissions, is actually, you know, we're very good at monitoring the crop right the way through the growing season, um, but we're not very good at actually uh, monitoring at point of harvest. Um, and this is a, some te technologies that uh, allow us to actually get live. Um, actually, a mixture of, of, of fine tuning when you actually harvest, um, but then also gives you live quality readings on the harvester, whether it's a combine or a potato harvester or a pea viner. Um, and that allows you to then uh, segregate different qualities off the combine so that you can actually then start to either um, sell very high quality into a higher premium market or you can start to mix uh, lower and higher qualities to, to, to try and pull the lower quality um, whether it's uh, nitrogen or whatever up into the premium uh, market um, and that, that not only gives you a higher average price um, but it actually reduces the wastage um, and that's particularly true in the pea quality one where the the um, acceptance of the pea into the, the factory is dictated by how tender it is. Um, and there's sometimes a two or three hour delay between the sample being taken, going to the factory, going through the tenderometer, and then going back to the harvesting squad. But if they can get if they can get instant data, they can then decide, well, this field's too late. Um, it, it's, it's gone beyond the tenderness. We need to leave this for another use and go to another field. Um, or it might not be ready yet. It's it's uh, it's got to go a wee while yet. So it gives them instant. It makes allows them to make a much more informed decision rather than than waiting. Um, the yeah, uh, and I think the, the, the we're also learning a lot about what's happening. If you take the onion zone one, this is about predicting bulb size so that they can store uh, different sizes of onion bulbs separately for different markets. Um, and what they found there is that part of that has been monitoring the stress. Um, and we found a correlation between storage quality and stress. So again, if we can uh, pick out the tubers that are going to or the, the bulbs that are not going to have as good storage quality and store them separately and get rid of them early on, 
it's going to reduce your wastage, it's going to reduce your carbon footprint, it's going to reduce your emissions from waste. So again, it's back to this, we have to look at the, the bigger picture uh, and not just get too focused on the, on the individual elements. Um, and I think it's going to need this sort of uh, fundamental change in our approach to uh, food production to actually make, make the difference. You know, I think playing around with um, seaweed to reduce methane from cattle or whatever, that has a place, but it's not going to be enough uh, to meet the, the targets that have been set. And if we don't make this fundamental change in how we approach the job of food production, then it will be forced on us by policy because we have to do it one way or the other. Um, and I think, you know, that what I've tried to do is to suggest a way forward for farmers that every farmer can adopt, um, whether he's into organics or regen or just intensive sustain, sustainable sustainable intensification. It's up to the it's up to the individual. Um, and of course, with all these fundamental changes, I think the biggest challenge for me that the industry faces is actually the mindset. You know, how do we change farmers' way of thinking uh, from from what it's been for for generations? Now, there are obviously going to be a lot of barriers uh, to come up with, especially in the early the early days. One of them is is cost. Um, but I remember when the uh, first big flat screen televisions came out. I can't remember what big sporting event it was that I thought, oh, I'd really fancy one of these uh, big flat screens to watch this cup final or whatever it was. Um, and I went to it, investigated it, and it was about three and a half thousand pounds. So I thought I saw that. But there now, you can pick them up for probably 350 pounds. And it's just a volume thing. So, you know, the, the, the cost element will sort itself out. Um, but, but we need to make that fundamental change in, in, in our mindset. And I'll just leave it with that. Thank you. That's great, Gavin. Uh, thanks very much for that. Really interesting uh, presentation there from yourself and Robert. There's a good few questions coming in there too. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity first to ask uh, a question that I was thinking about uh, during your presentation, Gavin. It's probably something you get quite regularly too. Um, but how is there any kind of? Oh, we've lost Gavin, have we? No, nope, still here. Oh, I'm sorry, you just disappeared off my screen. Um, is there any kind of moves being made to to sort of integrate some of the um, platforms that these different technologies are being um, that that they're currently on? Because I know that. Um, if your <clears throat> farmers will be using multiples or will want to use multiples of these kind of different technologies and if it's all on different platforms it could be a, a, a fairly steep learning curve for people um, and I think having a, a management tool that kind of incorporates it all would be a good way to to get to encourage people to help take up these technologies. Yeah I mean compatibility is a big issue um, for sure yeah. uh, but th there are a number of um, companies uh, looking into that, uh, Glass Data is one that springs to mind who's probably as advanced as any of the ones I know, but, but there are a, a number of uh, companies just looking at building a platform, in fact including AgriEpi, they are trying to build a, a platform for the satellite farmers. Um, so yes, yeah, so building the platform itself is not such a difficult job. Um, it's getting the I think it's called an API from the uh, manufacturers of machines uh, to actually allow the remote link to happen. Um, right. And then you also come into the, you know, the GDPR, et cetera. So it is a bit of a minefield at the moment. And that's probably an area where policymakers or government is going to have to come in and actually, you know, draw down the rules to allow it to happen because we, we can't actually uh, I mean, we can achieve what I've described without that, but it, it would be really difficult. And not yeah, difficult across industry. I, I think I think that, as you said, that's key if people are going to um, take this up throughout the industry. Um, we, it, we'll go to some of the. Interestingly, there are some of the big manufacturers. You know, that recently have become much more 
uh, aware of the need to to collaborate. Um, so mm. the change is happening, and I think also in the farmer side, there's there's also been a, a reluctance to just give up data, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat now, and they're, they're becoming much more. They're, they're realizing that data actually, you know, I said we're going to have to farm data in the future, but it, it's also got a value. So. Yeah. I'll try and move on to some of the other questions that we've got. Um, there was one question here, and it was something, again, that I was kind of thinking about as you both were speaking. You both touched on the different multiple benefits that um, farmers provide uh, outside of actual food production um, and the, the, the focus on carbon, just carbon, uh, can sometimes put us in a bad light when there is so much more that, that farmers provide. So how can industry show the contribution to conservation, bio, conservation, biodiversity, all these other kind of multiple benefits um, going forward? And the, the, the question here is, can we develop a calculator that encompasses all of that? It's a really, it's a really good question. And it's one that, you know, carbon, we can measure, we can make assumptions, we can, we can have a, a robust calculator there, but from a biodiversity conservation point of view, it's it is harder. It's more, um, you know, it, it almost needs an, an inspection level. It needs a ways of photographing and ways of providing evidence that, that things are there. We do. There are app systems being developed, and and there's there's basically where there's a will, there's a way. Um, but certainly it's a, it's a challenge for the industry and, and one we, we need to get nailed fairly soon if we're going to be rewarded and be um, supported to do this a much needed job of improving biodiversity. You know, we need, we need lots of tools and, and, and options for that going forward. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's closer than maybe we think because... Uh, the uh, agri has got um, three live projects at the moment, which is using satellite imagery to uh, to look at the carbon storage in the soil um, or the carbon levels in the soil, uh, and they're linking that with uh, you know satellite imagery can pick up the tillage that was used to establish a crop. Um, it can pick up how crops residue was handled, whether it was baled or incorporated or whatever, that, that can all be done remotely. And, and what's probably missing is the, is the research to come up with the, the validated data to, to sense check or ground, ground sense the, the algorithms that are being developed by these companies. Um, and to take it a stage further, I'm involved in a project at the moment with Stirling University where they are looking at developing a business. It's the business unit at Stirling University. And they're actually developing a business analytics tool, which takes the raw data from the one we're looking at. It's a pig farm that grows his own food, cereals, um, only sells pigs. Um, and actually taking the, the, the raw data from the crop production, uh, crop process and pig production um, and developing a tool that will actually help the farmer to make the decision that I think I described earlier on, where um, he can look at uh, what happens if he changes the exclusion, the inclusion rate of soya on his emission rate, what happens on his productivity, and what happens on his profitability on the farm. And that's the three elements that we need to always look at in in. Uh, uh, if it's two, it's in tandem. I don't know what it is if it's in three, uh, but you have to look at these three elements. You know, at the same time, you can't. You have to look at emissions. You have to look at production efficiency, and you have to look at profitability. Um, and mm -hmm. and and the, the the work's ongoing at the moment to develop that. So, uh, the know. other one I think that's interesting is the the Laura Wan stuff. So there's a really interesting old school radio network technology being used basically as a, a network for sensors and opportunities there for measuring endless amounts of stuff from water levels, temperatures, air quality, crop heights. There's a lot of really good, and the, the, the beauty with that stuff is the, the system's pretty cheap. 
a the it's a bit you know it's rough and ready, but the, a computer brings it brings it, it all together. Uh, and certainly, I I think there's as Gavin says, where there's a will, there's a way with this stuff, and mm. uh, hopefully we'll see it um, developing going forward. I mean, the, the other perceived issue we've got going forward is the volume of data that's the the, the or the the, the potential for volume of data to be produced and how we're going to handle it. But, um, you know, 5G is just around the corner and there's three farms with 5G connectivity already who are handling huge amounts of data through imagery, um, a dairy, a pig and a, and a mixed uh, beef uh, farm. Um, so again, it, it, it's, it's all possible. It just, we just need to get the infrastructure uh, in play, and I think again that's where policymakers need to come in. I I was just about to add there that I suppose if support is going to be as you've both alluded to, kind of based on multiple benefits, um, government will have to come up with a a, a good way of measuring and monitoring uh, biodiversity, uh, conservation, these other kind of elements as well. So it's it's a it's not just on the industry to. Um, come up with a calculator or something like that. It's government will will need that too. So I'll move on now quickly. Um, there's another question here. Um, the the question is where are we now with with additives? Um, and why are we not being offered these? And just a bit of context to the question is that uh, Rom Romanson thirty years ago, um, seemed to have a, a, an impact on methane loss loss from rumens ruminant um so where are we with uh, additives and their ability to reduce methane emissions so rumensin was a bit before my time i know it's still used in dairy cows as a veterinary treatment for metabolic disorders um but rumensin actually it's a case in point it improves the or alters the microbiome in the ruminant in the rumen and improves its ability to convert forage. It makes it a more efficient animal, and more efficient animals have a lower carbon or a lower methane emission. It costs producing methane is a loss of energy. It, it takes energy to produce methane. So if we can reduce the level of methane coming from a rumen, will actually improve the conversion of that animal. So rumensin was quite old school. I think it's actually it's used as a treatment, or in, in America, it's used as a treatment for coccidiosis as well i think it's you know as it a it's more than just a feed additive but mm. i don't think we're going to see that one back but there are a lot of others that are available or, or coming on stream a uh, which will have a benefit and, and i think as gavin's put it really well tonight technology technology's got a great way of our industry's got a great way of coming in and dealing with a problem and, and we definitely as a globally have a, a, a massive methane issue and, and there's a huge opportunity for somebody to step in and uh, make progress there. So yes, feed additives are are certainly well on the agenda. Uh, whether Remensen comes back or not, I, I couldn't guarantee it. The other one that obviously is there, uh, almost again, the elephant in the room is um, GM, you know, gene editing, all kinds of things. There's a lot of scope in there and a huge debate to be had, certainly not one tip to be had in the last 10 minutes of a webinar, but there's certainly lots of scope um, for, for progress there. Great. We'll move on then. We've got um, a question here just about what impact does uh, medicine, uh, animal health, I assume, uh, have on your carbon footprint? So as it stands at the moment with agriculture, we don't actually include it because it's a very small, it itself is a very small. Um, Sorry, I, I don't think it's medicine inputs. I think just in general, um, vet, the, the animal health, what impact is that? Yeah. Or what, how, what, where is the importance of animal health yeah. when it comes so the, to carbon? The two sides, the, its impact in the carbon footprint is very small, the actual product itself, but what those products actually go on to achieve is massive. So mm. we are now looking at kind of three pillars of animal health is a fertility, survival and growth. And those, I should a, give Tim Geraghty, one of our vets, a good shout out for that one. So fertility, survival and growth, if we can get all of those things going well, 
the business will go well and the carbon perf performance will be good as well. With those, we need an input of vaccines. We need um, certainly appropriate anthelmintic use, control of fluke. You know, there's a, a lot of a, a, a huge need for animal health products but for that the fundamental to it is a health plan we can't go with a blanket approach as Gavin was saying it needs to be targeted inputs dealing with known problems rather than assumed problems. Yeah I think for me uh, medicines go to animal health uh, and the, the impact of um, poor health uh, is massive on our footprint and emissions. If you take the dairy sector, uh, our um, replacement rate in the dairy sector is something it's over 30%. And there's a huge chunk of that replacements come from fish lactation heifers who just don't come up to scratch. And, and that's often through subclinical issues. It could be respiratory issues as a, as a calf. Uh, it could be um, pure immune system through because of the way it was reared. Um, and, and we need to identify these animals uh, and get rid of them before they've even got the length of, the, uh, of an insemination. Um, because to, to rear them for you know, two years and milk them for another year, then to discover that actually that they're no use, that, that's a huge waste. And, mm -hmm. and waste is emissions, waste is carbon footprint. Uh, and again, technology, uh, we have ear tags uh, in calves uh, on farm um, that will show up pneumonia um, with one case and an excellent stockman, one of the best stockmen I know, uh, and uh, the ear tags picked up pneumonia two days before the, before the, the guy did. Um, mm. and, uh, and again, the same farmer using technology, he's stopped treating uh, mastitis with drugs and just use therapeutic treatments for mastitis. Um, so you're, you're, you're reducing the loss in production due to a health issue. You're reducing the wastage from taking animals through that won't actually perform because of, of uh, health issues in the rearing phase. So it's a really, really important area to me. Yeah. And, and I suppose if you're, if, if you're, um, bringing that animal on two years and then realizing the problem that's a waste of money too you know there's also that kind of element to it cool. so okay. basically what we do sorry James, what we do with that one is we take her from being a reasonably high value store animal and turn her into a really poor lightweight poor cull animal and and you know that's a you know that could be a swing of a thousand pound on the sale price never mind the rearing cost that exists there and we always say at that stage that, oh, it's just a heifer that couldn't handle the pace. But we need to remember we set the pace. You know, that's actually down to our management, down to our decisions. Bad things happen. You know, there's, there's things come along. But if that's something that's consistently happening, it's, it's certainly something that needs addressed. And time with your vet is very well spent trying to, trying to deal with those issues. Great. So we've got two questions left. Uh, so I'm going to try and get through them. Um, First off, so what role might improved biology in regenerative systems play in crop production? Well, I, th I think um, it, it doesn't matter how you improve the soil biology, as long as you improve it, uh, then, then that's going to give you a healthier soil. It, it's, it's more able to uh, hold up machinery. It's more able to allow a plant to develop a good rooting system to access nutrients and water. Um, it's, it's more able to, I mean, I'm not a soil scientist, but uh, a healthy soil, just like anything else, if it's healthy, it's productive. Um, but it, a healthy soil will also uh, store more carbon. So, um, so I think, um, and, and it, the soil is an interesting one because for years we've, um, we've really, we've measured soil health through chemicals, chemical analysis. Uh, but the, the latest uh, tests that are available are actually using nematodes. Um, and I believe that nematodes are the top of the, sort of the, top of the food pile in, the, in soils. And you've got bacteria consuming uh, nematodes and fungi uh, consuming nematodes. And the balance between the two apparently is, uh, 
is how you arrive at a soil health uh, indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, it, it, it's in the early days yet, but I think that's a really interesting way to look at soil, um, to look at its ability to uh, to maintain its 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 own um, uh, infrastructure, as in uh, uh, live infrastructure, yeah. as opposed to just looking at the chemical analysis. Needs both. It's all about balance, and even in in livestock health as well. But in the soil, is a great example. Is you know all about balance, and up to now we've used the we've got too much of that, so we'll knock all of that out. And then we land up, we knock all of that out, but we also knock out, you know, it's, everything's out of balance, out of sync. And I heard a quite a pretty compelling argument that the, the era of chemistry and agriculture is really very close to an end and the era of biology is really coming to, to a beginning, that there's, there's so much to do. And that's where I find the regenerative stuff very exciting. Uh, and, and I think there's the guys who'll do it holistically, you know, they'll do the, the, the full uh, regenerative job. And there's also the... As Gavin said, there's the, the guys who are more conventional, but there's so much power in this regenerative stuff that uh, pulling out the best parts of it, there's, there's great scope there as well. It's, it's quite interesting that the question was um, sort of pointed at regen agriculture. And now I'm a big fan of uh, regen or any anything that actually encourages the farmer to think more about what he's doing. You know, that gets the farmer to get down in his hands and knees and get a spade full of soil, get down in his hands and knees and actually look at what's happening. Uh, but probably the healthiest soil I've come across uh, is a farm up in Aberdeenshire that uh, farms conventionally plough, power harrow, uh, but he has a very strict rotation and his attention to detail is second to none. Every acre of ground gets either muck or chicken manure or recy uh, re, um, recycled um, uh, green waste, whatever. Um, and he's, you know, he'll uh, he'll he'll let a field go fallow rather than lose his rotation. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, anybody can do it. Uh, they don't have to follow uh, a particular path. These paths are excellent for, as I say, making people think about things, but yeah. anybody can apply themselves and, and maintain a healthy soil. I think just it, a, 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 sorry, just Robert, a, a wee plug for what we do as well. There's some very good, very healthy soils under grassland systems getting eaten by ruminants. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that I, I think what from both of you there it seems to be balance, balance, balance in the the biology in the soil with the chemistry, also with the actual management system that's in place, trying to take the best for best from all these different systems that are out there um, to what applies to you and best on your farm and what suits your system. That's kind of the 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 way forward. So, final question then. Um, and this is a quite a quite a big one, um, and it's from our colleague Alex Perry. Where do the speakers see the highest potential for emissions reduction in a given farm production production system? So he gave a couple of examples with reducing fertilizer, or smaller frame stock for less methane. So I suppose, what's your kind of one <laughs> highest potential? I would go first the. It's a good question and well done, Alex, for asking the question. The, the simplest option, you know, from, from a beef perspective is just to get rid of all your cows. And that's that will have a, the, the most amazing impact on your carbon footprint. But as again, going back to sustainability, it's not a sustainable business decision to make unless we're radically changing what you're doing. So assuming we're keeping in, we're being positive, we're keeping in the beef system. For me, it's that the pillars of fertility, survival and growth, if we can keep them in mind, if we can have a maintain a fertile herd, good calf survival and calves that grow well, we've got a very good, uh, if, we can, if we can make improvements in all these areas, we've got a really good fighting chance of uh, certainly we'll reduce our carbon footprint and, and hopefully make some money too. So I learned a long time ago that uh, and I learned the hard way that you never stand up in front of a farmer audience and say, this is the thing you have to do. 
uh, <laughs> problems. So I think, Alex, if you tell me which pattern uh, you want me to answer the question on, I'll tell you what is the the, the single uh, best thing on that particular farm. But next door, the farm will be completely different. So, so I think, again, that's what I said at the beginning. It's dangerous to focus on one thing because the, the, the challenge is so big and it's industry-wide that, that we need to get away from that single solution uh, way of thinking and actually look, what, what can we do as an industry to contribute and improve our net carbon balance and at the same time keep a sustainable industry to actually deliver uh, that, that balance. So, so I think you have to have a range of uh, elements being worked on out there and, and you need each individual farmer has to uh, have access to help and advice to, to work out what's the, the best plan for, uh, you know, for, for his farm. And I, I think that's a great takeaway yeah. point. Just that if if we all, if every farmer on this call was to go away and have a look and think about th think about what you just said there, Gavin, I think that'd be I'd be delighted with the outcome of this anyway. Um, so I think we'll 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 leave it there. But don't don't go just yet because I've one one or two more slides I just want to speak to you about if if we can get them. Oh. So this is just going back to COP twenty six. Um, as COP twenty six is the the kind of um, overarching theme of all of these webinars. I just wanted to point out to so many different ways that you can actually get involved um, with COP26. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity that it is going to be in Scotland. I don't think that we'll ever have an opportunity like this uh, again. So just to let you know that the UK government have a green zone events that are actually happening in, in Glasgow. Uh, you will you can attend those um, in person if you wish, and there are some of those events that are focused on agriculture and farming. They're all on the um, UK government or the COP26 website, which I will put into the chat just now. Um, but there is only a few events that are focused on food and agriculture, whereas. Um, Nourish Scotland um, and Pete Ritchie um, has done the power of work there. It, they wanted to kind of increase agriculture's uh, presence at COP26. So what they've done is there's a, um, a, a food and agriculture kind of um, area out, out, outside of the official COP, but there's going to be a, a, a huge amount of um, events on in that uh, recipes for resilience. It's it's in at the Salvation Army um, just near COP campus in Glasgow. A lot of the uh, stuff is online as well, but I'll just copy the link to that as well. It's another thing that will focus predominantly on food and agriculture. So again, I really, really think that um, you should make sure and um, contribute or take part in some of these if you can. The next one is actually on the 6th of November. It's a global day of action uh, is what they're calling it. It's a um, climate justice, um, climate justice protest, essentially. Now, I wouldn't normally be advocating that we go to protest or anything like that. But when I look at the, 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 the protest, um, the, the kind of groups that are in it, they, they specifically mention farmers and land workers and nature and biodiversity as, as a block of people that they want there. And I think that it's an opportunity. As I said, it's, it's an opportunity for um, farmers to talk to other people that have the same concerns as them when it comes to climate change and to kind of maybe even try and convince people who you think might not have the same kind of views on agriculture and, and food as, as you were trying to get them on board. So I think that it's a it's a good opportunity to go along to that as well. There is uh, events being held in all over the world, but in Scotland, we've got Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeenshire, and the Highlands and Islands, which I don't know where the specific, uh, specific Highlands and Islands event is, but I'll just share a link to that as well. And I don't think I've been sharing them to everyone. I think Robert has been doing that, so thanks. Um, back, Seamus. Don't worry. Thank you. Uh, then, essentially, then just all the, there's going to be loads of different events uh, online and in person uh, in and around Scotland and all over the world. Keep an eye on uh, the Farm Advisory Service social media, and we'll try and keep you up to date and keep you um, 
keep keep your keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Um, and it is really, really key, I think, that that farmers try and get to these events and have their say and, and put their perspective across. That's us for this evening. Next week, I have uh, Lillian O'Sullivan from Chagask uh, coming across to speak a bit about the benefits of hedges in sequestration and um, different things that's happening in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I also have Andrew Barber, um, who some of you may know from Mains of Fincastle, who is actively uh, incorporating agroforestry on his farm. As today, we kind of looked at efficiencies and improving efficiencies and what we can do on farm um, to reduce emissions. Next week, we're going to look at sequestration and how we can manage our land in such a way that we increase the amount of carbon that we're taking in. Um, so we're trying to cover all the bases. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank Gavin and Robert for their um, great presentations tonight. And I'd like to thank you for joining us and getting those questions in. And thanks again to Ian in the background who's keeping us ticking over. And on that note, um, have a good night and we'll see you again next week.